Welcome to the class Racism Under COVID-19. I'm going to walk you through some key ideas and concepts that you're going to need for this module. My objective is for you to be able to do at least three things in relation to racism under COVID. One is identify systemic racism. Two, identify common racist discourses against racial minorities. And three, understand the impact of systemic racism and racist discourses on racial and ethnic minorities and how it's exacerbated during COVID times. First, can you think of an example of racism under COVID? Write your example in the annotations in class for this video. To understand racism, we first have to unpack some key terms. First and foremost, we have to, we have to understand what consists of a race. A race is a group of people treated as distinct in society based on superficial physical differences that are made significant by a given society, for example, skin tone. Race doesn't reflect consistent genetic differences between groups of people. Rather, race is a socially and politically constructed category. Racial categories are often created to justify exploitation and disenfranchisement. For example, until 1960, according to the Indian Act, quote, Indians are not allowed to vote in municipal, provincial, or federal elections. So we see here a racial category created and named and placed into law by the colonial government that has an effect on how power and decision making is distributed. Some other examples are how Chinese, Japanese, East Indian, and South Asian Canadians were also denied the right to vote until the late 1940s. Race is also culturally specific and can change in different contexts. One way to see how societies construct race is to look at the historical experiences of particular categories of people in the United States. A century ago, Jewish immigrants and some other European immigrants were defined as non-white. After World War II, however, Jewish people were redefined as white folks. Now, let's break this racism down further. Racism involves both thoughts and actions. We're going to unpack several key ideas. Prejudice comes from the Latin words pre, meaning before, and judicium, meaning judgment. Prejudice occurs when people are biased either for or against members of groups, even before they have had any contact with them. Racial prejudice specifically involves beliefs that certain racial groups are innately inferior to others or have a disproportionate number of negative traits. Prejudicial beliefs are often based on stereotypes. Stereotypes are inaccurate generalizations about the appearance, behavior, or other characteristics of members of particular groups. For example, why are police officers more likely to stop men of color? Here we can see racialized stereotypes connected to perceptions of danger, crime, and so on. All stereotypes are hurtful, but negative stereotypes are particularly harmful to members of minority groups. Discrimination occurs when prejudice and stereotypes are put into action. Discrimination is defined as actions or practices of dominant group members or their representatives that have a harmful impact on members of a subordinate group. There's two basic forms of discrimination. De jure discrimination is legal discrimination which is encoded in laws. Examples of this in the Canadian context are the Chinese head tax and parts of the Indian Act. De facto discrimination is informal discrimination which is entrenched in social customs. It's not legally sanctioned, but it happens anyways. So what is racism then? Racism is a set of ideas that implies the superiority of one social group over another on the basis of perceived biological or cultural characteristics, plus the power to put these beliefs into practice in a way that controls, excludes, or exploits members of minority groups, and the power to transform prejudicial attitudes and discrimination into structures of oppression that function independently from the intentions of individual actors. 
Racism therefore involves not just different treatment, but different treatment in color conscious contexts of power. These contexts often limit opportunities or privileges. So we have talked about prejudice, stereotypes, discrimination, and racism. However, there is a difference between individual racism and systemic racism. The latter is often more invisible than the former. A good example of how racism can be independent from the intentions of individual actors, but rooted in our structures and systems is the bad cop versus good cop discourse in responding to police brutality. When it comes to police brutality, there is a common framing of bad apples in public discussion. In this article called Policing is Doing What It Was Meant to Do, That's the Problem, Todd May and George Yancey write, quote, on June 6, one of us attended a memorial vigil for George Floyd. The opening speaker first thanked the local police department for keeping the vigil safe and then went on to distinguish between the majority of police officers who do their job helping and protecting people and the few who are racist and violent. Even in Barack Obama's public statement on the killing of Mr. Floyd on May 29th, we can see the same discourse of bad apples or bad cops versus the majority of good cops. However, blaming racist violence on bad apples misses the point. We have to first recognize that racism can be rooted in our police structures and it can be independent from individuals' intentions. Law enforcement is a powerful institution rather than a personal presentation. It has become, quote, an unprecedented powerful cultural and political force protected by unions, officer brotherhood, police service acts, and it enjoys increased authority, lacks prose prosecution, and qualified immunity from prosecution, and so on. Therefore, the point is not about how many cops are good or bad. Rather, Mill's sociological imagination allows us to see the police are part of the state's organs of repression that maintain the social order based on a long history of racism and inequality between white and black communities. Before we jump to the next slide, let me ask you two questions. What do you think people would say if we were to ask them, one, do they think they are racist? And two, do they think the education system in Canada treats black students differently than white students? The first question concerns the idea of individual racism. Individual racism refers to an individual's racist assumptions, beliefs, or behaviors, and is, quote, a form of racial discrimination that stems from conscious and unconscious personal prejudice. That is from Henry and Tater, 2006. Individual racism can be overt and obvious, polite and subtle, or subliminal and unconscious. That is prejudices which individuals are unaware of, but that display themselves in discriminatory beliefs and behaviors. Individual racism is connected to and learned from broader socioeconomic histories and processes and is supported and reinforced by systemic racism. I'm going to talk now about an example of systemic racism in relation to Indigenous communities in Canada. If that is a triggering topic for you, then you're welcome to tune out and join us again um, in three slides. Uh, join us at the slide that says racism is more than an individual issue in a few minutes. So our example. A non-Indigenous individual might learn from the Hollywood films about cowboys and Indians and accumulate some negative stereotypes about Indigenous people, such as, quote, that Indigenous people have more problems with addiction, unquote, or the highly offensive stereotype and slur of drunken Indians. These harmful racist views held by individuals are connected to the social consequence of residential schools and genocide against Indigenous communities. Particularly, this is connected to the racist myth of genetic alcoholism. For decades, scientists have tried to prove that drug addiction and alcoholism are innate to Indigenous people, and many 
people have believed that indigenous bodies are more susceptible to addictions. However, research has shown that the high prevalence of alcohol use and its consequences among indigenous communities are attributed to a number of factors, including the influence of the European colonists who first made large amounts of alcohol available to indigenous communities and the intergenerational trauma associated with residential schools where families were broken by the state, the deprivation of land, the sense of dislocation and social exclusion, as well as the multiple forms of physical, sexual, spiritual, and psychological abuse during childhood. Now I'm going to read part of a speech given by St. John's Native Friendship Center cultural support worker, Amelia Reimer, on the colonial roots of mental health and addiction among indigenous peoples in Canada. Reimer states, to put it in perspective, quote, Imagine if your daughter, your wife, your sister, your mother turned up missing. How would it impact you if the authorities couldn't bother to do a proper investigation? How would you react if those in power around you merely shrugged their shoulders, refused to take action, and even taunted you with hurtful words over what type of person your loved one must be? Next month, your cousin is found dead, and you get the same inaction and cold shoulder again." Unquote. So we see here the use of drugs and other substances as self-medication in a colonial intergenerational trauma context. So to reiterate, the racist myth of drunken Indian has to be traced back to the history of colonization and socioeconomic processes that led to poverty and isolation among indigenous communities. The reasons for the increased likelihood of addictions are multiple and result from a combination of influences related to European colonization. These include, but are not limited to, lack of recognition of indigenous cultures, traditions, and languages, government policies, racism, discrimination, and stereotyping, breakdown in family structure, poverty, isolation, and residential schools, cycles of dysfunction, and intergenerational trauma. So in the last example, we saw that racism is more than an individual issue. While many Canadians as individuals might answer no to the question, do you think you are racist? Many Canadians might answer yes to the second question about differential treatment in institutions like the education system by race. It is important to recognize that individuals may not see themselves as racist, but they can still benefit from systems of privilege and oppression because there is systemic racism. So what is systemic racism? Let's first watch a video on this idea. 